Welcome, everybody. This is Tuesday Morning Ryan, episode number 35. Today we have Kelly Paxton with us. Kelly is a workplace dishonesty expert. And if you're wondering what that is, that's things like fraud, money laundering, embezzlement, all of the fun white collar crimes that people want to uh, do these days, it seems like. But you're an expert in investigating that stuff. So I can't wait to talk about it. You're also, uh, you have your own podcast. That's cool. Podcast host, uh, public speaker. You're an author of a book, which I want to ask you about because I, I wish I had the guts to write a book and the time. And uh, you're also a former U.S. special agent. So you have a very interesting background, Kelly. I, I appreciate you being here. I'm excited to talk to you. Well, thank you for having me and helping spread the word on pink collar crime, which I say it's the crime on Main Street. Absolutely. So Kelly, well, I have a lot of questions about like, uh, who does who does white collar crime? What is it? All that kind of stuff. But before we get into all that stuff, I, I want to talk a little about you. How did you a get into this whole industry of of crime, and then also start your own business and and become an entrepreneur? So, um, I did not grow up thinking I would be a special agent. Like I watched Charlie's Angels, and that was kind of the extent of it. But <laughs> as my dad would say, I'm very snoopy, and when things don't make sense especially with money and finances, it makes me dig. So I've had kind of like three iterations of my career. My first career was finance and investments. I worked at the Chicago Board of Trade. I was a stockbroker and a bond trader. And we had a client who I'm going to say was hinky. And this was back before know your customer, all that sort of stuff. And one day we got a phone call from a special agent from U.S. Customs Office of Investigations in Seattle. And um, she's like, do you know Alan? And I'm not sharing any secrets here. This is all public record. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, I was young. I was like 27, 28. And I kind of giggled. And I was like, oh, is that what he's calling himself today? And she's like, we're going to send a subpoena down. Well, the mistake on her part was we were a branch office. So, of course, because there was no know your customer, the broker told Alan and the money disappeared. She found it. He went to jail. All is good. But my husband was going to get his PhD at the University of Washington. He's like, call that woman who you knew something was wrong. So I called her and I'm going to say nine months later, I was in uh, Glencoe, Georgia, shooting guns and learning how to be a special agent. So then I went from investing money and seeing how people save and invest to seeing people steal and make money to finance these crazy lifestyles. Um, and then my husband got a job in the middle of the country with no border. And I, I, I call it the hardest three years of my life. I stayed home <laughs> with kids. And, uh, but then I started doing background investigations. We moved back to Oregon and I got my certified fraud examiner designation. I went to work for the local sheriff's office. And I noticed that it wasn't bad guys as I was the fraud analyst. It was everyday people that literally look like me and you. And they were stealing from dentists. They were stealing from homeowners associations from small business owners. And I was like, wow, these aren't bad guys. And it changed my viewpoint of crime. So one day I'm Googling in my office, because I love Google, um, women embezzlers, because all my suspects who were embezzling were women, except for one guy who I said stole like a woman. And I came across the term pink collar crime. That's not my term. It's people with PhDs that came up with it. And the definition is that was popularized in 1989, low to medium level employees, comma, primarily women, comma, who steal from the workplace. So I'm kind of known as the fraud hashtag queen because I love hashtags because I can find out where I put stuff, you know, in the World Wide Web and um, it's position, not gender. But women excel at embezzlement because think of 90 percent of bookkeepers are women. And we trust women. So, so walk me through a scenario. So for those who are uninitiated in the world of crime, you're at a small business. You want to commit some type of pink collar crime. What does it look like? How does the opportunity reveal itself and what do they do? So there's the fraud triangle, which is opportunity, pressure and rationalization. And this was popularized in the 1950s. And you have to have all three. So think of that low level employee who works at a business who knows where every dime comes into the business and goes out of the business. Sometimes it goes out of the business via the CEO living out of the corporate checkbook. And there's a bad culture, a bad tone at the top. And this woman, or it can be a man, 
One day, her kid texts and says, I need the last $200 for my field trip to go to Washington, D.C. And she's like, hmm, I, you know, I'm not getting paid for three weeks. Um, my boss just took this crazy trip to like Key West and wrote the whole thing off. Here's a check for 300 bucks. I'm going to take it. And it's not hard. That's my other sort of, I'm not a CPA. I could never be a CPA, but hashtag, it's not rocket science. Money is here and it goes here. It doesn't go from here to Panama, to Liechtenstein, to Dogecoin, to the suspect. It's, and think about it. Cops have to do these cases. Cops aren't CPAs. Like, you know, so it's a, it's a pretty basic, I'm going to say low level crime. It's opportunity. uh, How, so as I own a small business, let's say there's folks committing crime. These are pretty small dollar amounts. In general, they right? I mean, I'm guessing. So how does someone approach you to say, I think someone's stealing from me? Is it like they file a police report and you get called in to investigate? Or is it only they only notice it after it becomes $20,000 and actually hits their bottom line? When when does this actually come up typically? Well, um, so tips find fraud. And when I say tips, it can be a whistleblower, it can be a coworker, it can be the bank calling you, Christian, and saying, hey, Christian, is there any reason that this check from ABC Corporation should be going to, you know, Ryan? And you're like, mm, no. And that's what starts it. And it, I'm going to say it hockey pucks, it, um, uh, it can start small, it can start as a mistake. And it literally can grow over time. So I know a woman who the travel agency mistakenly billed a personal trip to her corporate credit card. And sure enough, it was right around Christmas. She, at Christmas, she got texts, she got emails. She comes back and she realizes that, you know, her trip was put on the company credit card. And she's like, you know what? I'll just pay it back next month. I had a lot of expenses at Christmas. And then she says, they texted me. I emailed all these, you know, it was my vacation. No, $400,000 later. And it started off with airplane tickets. And so someone just kind of realizing, hey, I, I can do this. I can get away with it. Wait a minute. I can't yeah. get away with it. I should keep doing it kind of thing. Yeah. When do you turn down a raise? It's like a raise. You don't ever turn down a raise, do you? Yes, you, you do not. <laughs> You're correct. You don't. So, so you've, you decided at some point, after doing this in various capacities that you could turn this into a career as a solopreneur. So I I definitely want to hear about that journey. How did you decide, Hey, I'm going to start a business doing this. And and can you talk a little bit about what do you do for organizations today? Yeah. So I was at the sheriff's office and I was part-time temporary because taxes, you know, they only have so many line items. And um, I went to the annual um, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners Conference in Las Vegas. And I, it was their 20-year conference. And I met Harry Markopoulos, who found out about Bernie Madoff. You know, it took years for him to get the SEC involved. And I came back and I quit my job. And I'm like, I can do this on my own. And um, I work through attorneys. So attorneys hire me to do investigations. Now, to be perfectly transparent, I don't do a lot right now because of COVID. And I prefer, instead of whack-a-mole, one at a time, I prefer to go on the front end and teach businesses the sort of things to look out for so they catch it before it happens. They put guardrails in so their employees don't do it. Um, However, saying that, no one wants to pay for prevention. You know, I I hammer on it and I, you know, I'm all over the internet. I hammer on it. but. your business, you come in on the backside a lot of times. The problem is the backside's more expensive. So yeah, there's so um, many parallels with cybersecurity in, in yeah. the sense that like it, it's it's a it's a non traditional crime, it's a non violent crime. It's all it's the same triad exists in terms of opportunity and, and things like that. And then uh, the people executing it are typically you know folks not unlike yourself. And it's just like you said, there's a lot you can do to prevent it, but people are resistant towards often paying for the prevention and you come in on the back end. So that's very interesting. And you mentioned something you said, um, you said that uh, there is prevention to this. 
And me as a business owner, I'm, I'm thinking, well, what is the prevention? Because I could see how you could catch it. You know, John Doe uh, paid for his vacation. But I, I actually can't think of ways outside of maybe culture or something that you could go to prevent that. So what are some, what's some of the type of advice that you're giving businesses to prevent fraud? Um, I like to say surprise and delight. And, you know, we always say surprise and delight your customers. Surprise and delight your employees. So if your employees think that you only look at checks over, say, $5,000, pull a check for $1,000 and say, hey, I want the invoice for this $1,000 check. So they think you're looking at all checks. So, um, you know, I saw this and I, sometimes my head just explodes when I see things online. Um, and one of the things was an attorney in Canada did wrote an article about the best way to prevent embezzlement is to require two signatures on a check. And my head exploded because the number one way that people embezzle is forged or unauthorized checks. So two signatures, well, I can forge two signatures instead of just one. Like this is where, so I actually had a moment where I reached out to a woman who is the accounts payable guru, world guru. And I'm saying, am I missing something here? <laughs> She's like, yeah, no, because first off, who does paper checks these days? Like we're moving away from paper. My kids don't know how to write a check. Like, do you write very many checks or do you do, you know, payments, online payments? Oh. So two signatures on a check, my head exploded. Like if you have an attorney that says the best way to prevent embezzlement is to get two signatures, get a new attorney. The other thing is, Make your clients or make your employees take vacations. If you have an employee who doesn't take vacations, why? It's because when they're on vacation, that bank statement's going to come in or that customer's going to call and say, my statement does not show my cash payment last month for $5,000. They have to get the phone. They have to open the mail. They have to be there all the time. They're not, I mean, I had a woman medical professional who, when she realized she was embezzled, we looked through the key cards. Like, okay, you sort of, you know, um, I'm going to say techno people, you've got so much data. And she's like, the key cards? And I was like, yeah, the key cards. Let's see when she shows up for work. In six and a half years, she missed a day and a half. And of course, the woman medical owner was like, gosh, she's so dedicated. And I'm like, no, she's not. She has to be here. And it turns out she was cutting side deals with patients and they would come through the office on Fridays when no one was there. So they have to go on vacation and it can't be two or three days. It needs to be a week or two weeks. So, so you and then obviously lastly, have, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Do it. Oh, last lastly, time. this is like, none of these are expensive. Realize. I mean, people, earn their vacations and everything. The other thing is mail your bank statements home or to a PO box you control. No one should get your bank statement before you. There's this guy and he's a world famous speaker and I'm listening to him on a podcast and he's talking about how he's so successful and how he manages his money. And he's like, so I have my guy call me every Friday morning and he tells me what's in my bank accounts. And I'm like, he tells you trust but verify. You can't, you don't know if that guy's got a gambling habit, has a side gig with, you know, whatever. He, he literally trusts him to say that he has a million dollars in five different accounts. He might have $10,000 in three accounts. You have to trust, but verify. You have to get your bank statements first. Do you do that, Christian? I do. I'm okay, Actually, good my job. business partner and I, my business partner, to his credit, is, uh, he keeps finances very close to heart okay. <laughs> and, and, and by nature, I do too. So um, you have a spidey sense, right? I, I can just tell like you, you, you can probably spot it. You probably walk into organizations and have, you know, a checklist of 10 things and you know where to look. Um, what's some advice for business owners or, or people uh, say I own a dentist office or me, I own a small business. Are, are there things that people can look, look out for? that just kind of are red flags. You're like, all right, maybe there's something to see here where there's smoke, there's fire. What, what kind of things are you looking for? Okay, so I call those pink flags. And um, a really easy one is a parking lot audit. 
and they call it the parking lot audit. And it actually came from a colleague of mine. I was like, just look out the window and see what your employees are driving. Now it's a little harder in COVID. Um, but if you have a $30,000 a year employee and he or she shows up in a new Tesla every six months, bingo. Like, you know, the parking lot audit is, and I've seen it happen so many times. I just had someone reach out and goes, do you have a checklist for the parking lot audit? And I'm like, it's called open your eyes. Like, does the lifestyle match the salary? Like, I have a thing for Disney. Have you ever been to Disney? I have not. My wife is uh, very angry at me because I have two children. So we. Oh, you have, have to, to do it. Okay. <laughs> you have to do it. But Disney is really expensive. If you have a $30,000 a year employee who goes to Disneyland for two weeks and stays on park, that's a $30,000 vacation. It doesn't make sense. So the lifestyle, does it match the salary? You're the CEO. You know what everyone makes. Now, someone might say, well, my husband's got a really good job. Well, if your husband has a really good job, why are you working for $18 an hour and driving, you know, in Seattle traffic, however long? So that's the spidey sense. Does it make sense? I mean, I was on um, a booze cruise on a trip recently um, in Mexico. And this woman started talking to me. And of course, she's like, oh, my God, I have to tell you my embezzlement story. Because everyone has one. Like every it, there's no six degrees. It's one degree. <laughs> and this is another thing to watch out for is she goes, I had a boss and I can't remember his name. And I, I wouldn't say it online. He was very famous, very like he was on boards. He lived in Texas and his wife lived in Florida. And he had, I'm going to say, a sidekick meaning a woman. Well, his administrative assistant started showing up in Manolo Blahniks and really nice purses and things like that. Now, how did she do it? She started stealing, not from her boyfriend boss. He wasn't even her boyfriend, but she knew and she covered for him. She totally covered for him. So, you know, when he finds out that she's actually stolen a half a million dollars, he, he just fires her. He didn't prosecute her because she, I'm sure, threatened to call the wifey and say, hey, you know, your husband's in Texas and he's not where you think he is. So, so just to, so you're just looking for lifestyle mismatches. Like, that's just yeah. an easy one. You're like, hey, A doesn't equal B. What's going on here? And then probably match that with, well, do they have access to an expense account or to checks? And if those things add up, then that's a good opportunity to look maybe do a little bit of investigation. What about like systematic stuff? Are, are you, how, like in my space, we're in cybersecurity. So like automation and machine learning and all those kind of topics are, are all the craze, right? And I, I can I often see behind the curtain and the reality is, you know, things aren't always where you want them to be in terms of the capabilities to actually use that stuff. Are you seeing, what are you seeing in like the fraud and the forensic investigation side? Is there a lot of automation or is it still manual and you're using your gut instinct a lot? So, you know, crime on Main Street is all the artificial intelligence, machine learning in the world is not going to help you if you don't open your bank statements. So you say that your partner is, runs the money really close. A lot of people run the finances through their head. For example, you sell 10 million widgets and you net a dollar a widget. In your mind, you're like, I got $10 million in the bank. And you don't, again, trust but verify. So you could have all this artificial intelligence and machine learning, but if you're not even actually opening your bank statements, it's not going to help you. Now, it will help you if you actually look at the reports and you see those outliers. You know, an easy thing is, I say easy, um, you have someone who is in charge of the vendors and all the vendors get paid on day 25. But this one new vendor gets paid on day five. Why is it? It turns out that that new vendor, you know, has the same zip code as the person who's in charge of the vendor master. I mean, again, it's not rocket science. Like, why is everyone getting paid on day 25, but this one new vendor gets paid on day five? And there's no discount for getting paid on day five. So like, I'm a huge fan of data analytics, even though it's not my jam. I love it because you see these like outliers. 
But when you see the outlier, there might be a reason for it. Like, but at least you don't have to look at every transaction. You first look at the outliers. So I do believe in technology to help, especially in big businesses. But I can show you big businesses that get ripped off all the time. So it comes down to you have to validate. You have to check where the money is. Makes total sense. We, we see the same thing in cybersecurity um, in terms of. So the phenomena that we see in cybersecurity is everyone wants to not do any housekeeping. Well, not everybody. A lot of people want to do no housekeeping and jump right to the fun stuff, which is like the tools and technology that you think will solve your problems. Yet you haven't done some of the basics, like the culture stuff or the uh, who has access to what type stuff. And I hear the same thing in, in, in your industry, like who has access to what? Like only give people access to checks who need it. Do a couple spot checks, uh, do some internal audits, that kind of thing, and or culture from the top. If the CEO is spending freely and uh, and not being very good steward of the business, then your employees won't either. We see a very similar phenomenon in cyber. Uh, another cybersecurity tie-in that I wanted to hear from you on is uh, I noticed when I was re re reading your website that you had uh, open source intelligence gathering yes. as like an element of uh, investigation. And when we do like penetration tests, everyone thinks that we kind of bring in a set of tools and magic happens and suddenly have access. But a lot of what we do is, you know, looking for open passwords online or, or investigating people on social media and, and, and figuring out links and who's connected to who, which you can use for cybersecurity purposes. Talk about what you guys do in fraud. How, how is open source intelligence gathering relevant to what you do in your investigations? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so if you're going to embezzle, I'm going to say, get off of Facebook. But they don't. <laughs> like, so one of the first places I'll go to, and especially, I'm, you know, I don't want it. Women really excel at this. But, um, you know, there's FOMO. There's, look at me, I'm in Disney or I'm in Vegas. And I will go on Facebook. And if they're showing all sorts of stuff that is not tied to sort of their salary, I'm just pulling it down. I have pictures and pictures and stuff like that. So I love open source intelligence. Um, I don't do as much of it as I used to just because of how my business has changed. But um, you give me someone's name and it's not Jane Doe or John Doe. Oh, I'm, I'm doing open source intelligence because there's so much. And I will tell you, and I'm sure you know this, the families are the weak links. So say you get a CEO and he's got everything locked down. Yeah, well, he's got a kid who's taking pictures of the yacht in the Mediterranean. And I can find that because the family is always the weak link. I don't know. what Has that been the case for you guys? You can always get a connection when you're looking for someone because someone liked a post. You go to there. Like uh, often what we'll see is someone's uh, social media, let's say, is really locked down. You can't see anything. But you can see who liked the post. Well, the, the wife liked the post. Her stuff's open. Well, guess what the wife does? They post everything about the husband that you're trying to get to or vice versa. So, yes, the family is uh, almost certainly a way to get at open source intelligence gathering from our perspective. Yeah, but no, I mean, people want to show off. The other thing is no one steals to save. They're spending their money. Is this kind of like when you're doing investigations, is this part of that case building process where you're saying like oh, someone comes to you and says, I suspect this person's embezzling? And then you say, all right, well, let me just some sanity check here. And the open source intelligence gathering is part of, you know, a sanity check. Yeah, they're going to Disney twice a year. You know, their salary isn't lining up to their lifestyle. I think there's something to look at. Is that the type of a, a use yeah. case for open source intelligence gathering? Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. What, what about motivations? Like, have you noticed any kind of theme behind the why? I, I keep relating this back to cyber because in cybersecurity, <laughs> Why do people commit cybercrime? It's usually profit motive. Um, there's there's different organization structures when it comes to the criminal uh, state. So you have like the cr criminal element, you have the nation state element. So the why and the motivation behind it's always an interesting discussion. In the in the fraud and crime space that you're doing it, is it just greed, or is there some other reasons why people are doing this? Well, one of my hashtags is greed, not need. And another hashtag is need not greed. So um, I'm going to say, and this is anecdotal, a generality, 
women initially steal for an actual need. But then it's kind of like getting the raise. You're never going to give it back and you like the money. And it just makes life easier. And, you know, that's the thing is like my career has always been about money. Most people think more money makes life easier, but they don't look really far down the road and realize that, you know, it's all going to come crumbling down. That So, and you've mentioned this a couple of times, culture and tone at the top. Now, I just finished listening on Audible to um, The Cult of We, and it's about Adam Newman and WeWork. And if you haven't read or listened to it yet, oh my God. Like, I mean- I'll have to check that one out. I haven't read that yet. Uh, it just came out. Um, yeah. So tone at the top is really, really important. I mean, so you have the fraud triangle, opportunity, pressure, and rationalization. We always say control the opportunity. That is the easiest thing to control because you can lock things down with internal controls. Pressure, you could pay your assistant a million dollars a year. And if he or she has a $2 million lifestyle, well, it's not going to help. It's crazy to pay him that much. And then rationalization, um, rationalization is just, I have this one case I always talk about. A friend of mine, her, um, she had a client who thought he was getting embezzled. She dumps the data. He goes around and he explains who has what responsibilities. And he thinks segregation of duties. And he gets to his assistant, and I'm just going to call her Susie Q. And he says to my friend, oh, don't even look at Susie Q. She's too dumb to steal from me. Now, if I were there, I would have said, Susie Q, let's go to Neiman Marcus, and I'm going to show you really how to steal. That attitude will not help anyone. And guess who stole? It was her. So he was, he was so dismissive of her skill. Yet you don't have to be Bernie Madoff. It, they know where every dollar comes in and where every dollar goes out. And they know when the boss is in a good mood and when the boss is in a bad mood. So you don't take in an extra check for them to sign when the boss is in a bad mood and decides that he or she is like going to look at everything really closely. When they're in a good mood on a Friday afternoon and they're getting ready to you know, go off on their private jet, that's where you slide a bunch of checks in and they don't pay any attention. So that's so. interesting. So we, you talked about the, I actually ignored that when you, when you said it earlier. I didn't ignore, but it didn't like resonate because uh, opportunity, that's clear. They have access to do it. They have a need. That's the other one. Uh, so clearly I, I got bills to pay or whatever, my lifestyle, I got I to gotta steal to do that, or I feel I do. But the rationalization one's interesting because that's when you can arguably control the most for free. Because yeah. it sounds like, I mean, usually people just need a reason to feel, feel okay about doing it. Like, I don't like my boss. He's a jerk. He doesn't pay me well anyway. You know, he's not, and he drives a Porsche. He's not going to miss, you know, a few hundred bucks. Whereas if you have a really great culture and everybody feels accountable to each other and they feel like they're building something together, you know, the guilt's going to get to them. They're just like, I can't do this. It wouldn't be right. And, and that's, con and I'm hearing you say that's consistently a theme. Like you have to be able to rationalize oh, yeah. it or you're probably not going to commit fraud. How interesting. That's, I mean, it makes total intuitive sense, but I don't think as easier business owners we consider, yeah. It's a lot easier to steal from someone you don't like. Like it makes it's total just sense. Yeah. yeah. So moving a little bit away from the investigative side and um, into some of your career stuff. So I'm, I'm fascinated with people who provide professional services like myself and, and you who are, who are like you have a great social media presence. You have a good brand. You're, you're doing podcasts. You wrote a book. Um, and I, this phenomena of entrepreneurs doing that, and, and I use the term punch above their weight because you have like a media empire, but you're you know, a solopreneur. How did you get on that journey? What made you think to do that? What made you write the book and to start the blog and to do the podcast? Is it just natural in you to be kind of marketing or, or be coached to do that? How, how did you think to do that kind of stuff? So. Um... A little bit too much information here. Uh, so I was on my own after I left the sheriff's office for almost five years. Um, I got <laughs> recruited to go to a big company. I went there and I was retaliated against. When I left, or as I could say, pulled out the door, I was like, I can't work for 
I just, you know, here I did the right thing. I used the alert line. I reported something that I had seen and I'm the one who gets punished for it. And I was like, I can't go back into it. So I'm what you call a reluctant entrepreneur. I love a paycheck. I love getting paycheck every two weeks. Like, you know, um, I just, I'm at the point in my career where I'm not going to say I don't have to pay the mortgage, but like, I don't have the pressure that I had when I was a little bit younger. And um, I love what I do. Like, I mean, I truly love it. I actually just gave a presentation at the um, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners Global Conferences. Your brand is a CFE. Now, I worked for a company where everything was about your brand, and I hated that term. I just, I hated it. But it's true. Like, I'm known as pink. Like, I have people who refer to me as pink on social media. And um, a lot of people think it's gender based. And so some people don't like it. I can't get away from it. So I'm just, I'm 150% into it. And I love my work. I mean, yeah, Um, COVID made me write the book. Like all my in-person gigs got canceled. I'm like, and I had been working on it for a while. And finally, I just buckled down and hired an editor. And then I started the podcast. And yeah. The rest is history. Talk about writing. So I'm selfishly interested in the book writing process because I do a ton of writing, not in the style of a book, but in the style of like a report or a blog post or a white paper. And, uh, but finding the discipline to sit down and like write a book is something that seems very daunting to me. So how how did you do it? Was it something you wrote over years? Did you just sit down for a month and grind it out? What, What was that process? It, there were stops and starts and, um, but I had so many people tell me, like, you have to write this. And actually, I, I didn't write the book for, like, my peers. This is for business owners. And my daughter will say it's a pamphlet, but it's over 100 pages. And um, I wanted it for business owners to not feel shame and humiliation and for them to say that they could see themselves in that light. Like, it's a very light afternoon read. And there's a lot of stories. So it's all about the story of how it happened. I'm a big, um, I hate it when people shame victims. And that's why they say only 15% of all embezzlement cases get turned into law enforcement because these business owners are embarrassed that that, you know, cute little ditzy blonde at the front stole a half a million dollars from me. I'm smarter than her. How could she have done this? And they're embarrassed. Or that cute little, you know, whatever payroll person knows that you've got a side gig and is going to go or knows you have two sets of books and will turn you into, you know, the state revenue association. Your genius as a business owner is up here. The bookkeeper, the accounts payable person, they're down here. You're not paying attention to that because that's not what your genius is. Like, so you have to hire people that you know, like, and trust. You're not going to hire a thief purposely. But maybe you should because then you would check them. Like so, you know. So the book, um, I'm doing a terrible job plugging it. So it, it, tell me the name of the book. It's it called Embezzlement, if I recall. Show me the cover. Where do we buy it? Is it like on Amazon or something? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Yeah, embezzlement. And it's, awesome. And there's tons and it, of like there's tons of resources. So I did hire an editor, and he he kept me in line. Um. Start with the outline and just do the stuff that you want to know. Like I did it about like some of the crazy stuff that happened to me. So you just think of someone who's sitting down and reading it. You know, we have this ideal customer avatar. Mine isn't my peers. It's business owners because they're the ones so who get the, the money stolen. Owner. Yeah. I love that. It's so interesting to me, this whole entrepreneur thing in terms of the amount of, I, I talk to a lot of folks who are like myself and, and you who are in these relatively small niches, you know, it's like everyone doesn't know about embezzlement and, and the kind of crime that you know about. And uh, I talked to someone uh, other who does uh, uh, improv uh, style leadership coaching events. It's like I've never even heard of anyone who does this and, and had a similar kind of brand like you did. And the modern internet has, and just the way we do business, even through COVID, has allowed people to publish books on a very niche topic that speaks to an audience, acquire gigs, 
chat remotely, build a brand for themselves, tell a story. And I just think that's so neat that, that folks are able to do that because, you know, someone as talented as yourself would otherwise be in, uh, you know, working for a large corporation and no one ever know that, you know, Kelly Paxton is uh, one of the best investigators there is, but now you're able to let them know that. I just think that's really cool. That's a theme that, that keeps coming up. Um, talk about, I, I know that people are going to listen to this and, and want to hire you. I, I, so how can people, what are the types of things people engage you to do and how would they contact you if they want to talk to you or wanted you to help them out? So my sort of signature topic is catch me if you can today's pink collar criminal. Again, it's position, not gender. So I am not picking, I want women to exceed, excel more than anything. So it isn't about gender, but, and usually I get pushed back by women, but which is kind of ironic. Um, but I also, I give a talk called Honestly Dishonest, a fraud examiner's perspective. And another one, why honest people steal. I have a gig coming up in September and it's a, a lucrative industry. The guy saw me at a conference, a small conference, and uh, he was he's like, I want to keep my employees honest. I want to put guardrails in. And I'm so excited that he would be proactive to do this. So there's, you know, there's the fraud work and I'm going to bring my books for them. But I'm also going to bring a lot of books about behavioral science, behavioral ethics, because people aren't rational. If people were rational, we wouldn't steal. We wouldn't, because if you're rational and you're like, I'm going to get caught, I'm going to go to jail, I'm going to go to prison. But people steal every day, every single day. So if you have a culture where your employees are like, God, if I get stolen from, or I mean, if I steal, I'm going to prison. So there's the, like, you know, the broken windows theory, like you replace, if one win little window is broken, you quickly replace it because, and it's been disproven. But if you find someone who accidentally um, charges their trip to Hawaii on the company Amex, do you fire them instantly? That's kind of like the broken windows. You just cut them off at the knees and send them. Or do you like have an environment where they're like, hey, the, tra the travel agent actually put my trip on the company card and I need to pay it back. And you don't worry. There's this whole psychological safety. If you don't feel safe at work when you make a mistake, you are going to hide the mistake. And my thinking is, you know, the cover up is worse than the lie. For sure. So I know you have uh, your website, kellypaxton.com. You do obviously some pretty cool talks to help drive a better culture of, uh, you know, not doing crime. Um, buy the book uh, on Amazon, Embezzlement on Amazon. Awesome. Kelly, I really appreciate you, you joining me today. And it's so interesting to hear about like how you've built your career and the, and the stuff that you're doing. So thank you so much for joining. And if you're watching this and you like content like this, you like hearing about other entrepreneurs, we often talk about cybersecurity and privacy. You can check out Tuesday Morning Grind on YouTube. So just go to YouTube, search for Risk360. We have a playlist called Tuesday Morning Grind. You can also find Tuesday Morning Grind on any of the podcast apps out there. If you're on Apple or Spotify or Google or whatever you want, you can do that. Also, I want to let everybody know that we're putting content on YouTube for free that teaches you about cybersecurity. So we've took in the, uh, taken a bunch of the cybersecurity frameworks like ISO 27001, SOC 2, pen testing, a bunch of stuff, and have the experts at our firm going through the frameworks and going through the material and just breaking it up and providing content for free. So if you're on a learning journey and want to know more about that, check us out on YouTube. So thanks again, Kelly, and thanks everybody for listening. Thank you so much.